right, well, we will keep things moving. Um, we will now go into the second half of our talk with uh, Python, as well as running jobs on Perlmuter. And so yesterday we introduced using Python at Nurse, and today we'll continue that final um, section of that and focus on using Python on GPUs at Nurse. And so getting started with GPUs in Python, uh, you want to utilize a number of different tools that we have available. Um, one thing that you want to consider is that for some of our scientific applications, we have specific Python GPU frameworks that we use in place of our traditional Python libraries, such as NumPy and SciPy. And so uh, the, the drop-in repl replacements that we do use are QPy and Rapids. And so these are uh, machine learning libraries that we can use to support um, general GPU as well as other computing paradigms. And so for GPU computing, we have our PyTorch, TensorFlow, and JAX libraries that we can use as well. Um, and for other GPU-specific kernels, we have um, the capability to write your own kernels, such as with CUDA Python and Numba um, as well. Um, other available frameworks that are out there for everyone to use um, also include other versions of MPI Pi that also includes multi-node and GPU version. You can have Dask as well as, well as QNumeric as well for other different paradigms. So we have a lot of different uh, GPU libraries that can be used on Perlmuter, and these are all able to um, make use of the uh, CUDA array interface, and that allows for objects to be stored in GPU memory so that they're more easily accessible um, as well. Um, what might, what is the, the biggest benefit perhaps of having a modified uh, Python environment for CUDA? How, how, how is it beneficial for us to be able to store that information within the uh, GPUs versus having to recompile it or recompute it? General question. Anyone want to answer? What benefit do we have from being able to take advantage of a, a CUDA enabled um, array interface for Python? That's great. Right, I mean, everything, uh, computation and, and machine learning is gonna be uh, memory bound and you want to make sure that you reduce uh, any latency in accessing. So, you know, optimizations like this help us to be able to more efficiently use Python. All right, and so using Python on Perlmuter, you want to make sure that you um, have your um, appropriate uh, modules loaded, especially using uh, CUDA Toolkit. It's dependent upon making sure that you have Conda loaded. And so in order for you to use the, the CUDA Toolkit module is gonna be loaded by default, and then you can make sure you can also access the, well, the current version is going to be 11.7. So once you have loaded your Conda environment, you can create your custom environment that you want, and you will just use the conda create command. Um, you will have the, again, the flag for what you want to name it, and then any specific uh, libraries and frameworks that you want to include. Uh, you can, then you want to activate your environment using the, the conda activate command, and then the name that you have chosen for that specific environment. And then you also want to be able to use uh, pip install, um, to uh, install the any specific uh, dependencies that you might need, and then you're able to activate and use your environment for appropriately. So that is uh, basically how you would launch your Conda environment for using CUDA. CUDA. Um, if you need to um, undo or, or if you want to use a different dependency option, you can unload that tool, CUDA toolkit as well and then you're able to use other uh, packages that you can use to pull the specific dependencies that you want to use upon um, once you reactivate as well. So it's different ways that you can set up your environment um, based upon your needs and what you prefer. 
And again, all of this type of documentation is available on our nurse documentation web, on our nurse documentation on the web. And we're looking to make um, ways to make that more easily accessible for you. So as you work through it and you have any type of recommendations for organization and how you want to, or what you think about might be a better way for you to visualize and find information, uh, please let us know through submitting a help update. Now, uh, a very important consideration for everyone to keep in mind is you might have a, uh, a Python code that runs very good on a CPU, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is going to run real well on a GPU. Um, what might be some type of factors or considerations that might affect whether your current application that is might be parallel but not for GPU, um, what might limit it from being highly efficient on converting it to running on a GPU and CPU? What things would you might would you have to consider? I guess like a visual model would be much more demanding on the GPU versus the CPU because it's a graphics. Uh, GPUs has to do with the graphics, right? So it's, uh, if you're trying to model something, it would be much more demanding on that. But if it's just computational, probably heavier on the CPU. I always thought it assume. So could you kind of clarify that because? Uh, so I know, I don't know. But I think I think you want to keep in mind the uh, the visualization aspect, depending on how the cap calculations are done. That's still going to require the calculations in order to compute the right. visualization. I guess I don't have a good answer. To it. It's okay, like, no, I'm you, just uh, assuming because I don't know too much about it, but no. I know that GPUs generally have to do with that visualization of something, mm -hmm. at least on. Uh, the level of computer that I use. So yeah, I that's a, that's a good point. One yeah, thing to consider is, is yeah, I can do that. Why don't you do that one? I just need to get it. I'm sorry if you're online. If you should please mute. All right, I think I have that. But one thing you you're on the right track with that. But one thing you want to consider is it's not just a. Uh, the graphics or the visualization, there are computations that are done to create that. So that still is a part of how that's created using a GPU. Right. Any, any other thoughts? And it's, it's, that's a good um, you know, way of thinking to try and figure out what the, the right, you know, correct answer is. So because I know that GPUs are used for uh, mining as well. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the full implications of what a GPU does other than that, I guess, now that I'm thinking about it. Okay. Because I know that a lot of uh, people who data mine use like very extensive GPU systems. So mm -hmm. I don't know. So is it that CPUs can do many, some calculations very fast, but GPUs can do many calculations very slow? Or am I off? You kind of, so GPUs are able to do, or able to do quick calculations in parallel across um, various cores. So that's why you see the emergence with generative AI and um, you know using it for crypto mining because there are calculations that are done, whether it's um, doing approximations to generate like a, a image that you have that are easily done on a GPU because it doesn't require as much memory. You just need that calculation quick versus on a CPU. You can do, you can have parallelization, but if you have an application that requires a little bit more um, memory to do that computation, then it's going to be more ideal for CPU. And then you can have aspects of it where you're able to combine it. So you can have, um, you know, parts of your application might be more appropriate for you to execute on a CPU, and then parts of it are going to be for GPU or GPU CPU hybrid. So we get into different programming paradigms, and that's what we want to make sure that we're considering and taking into account. And so, you know, with the CPU, we see that we can have it be um, mainly going to be low latency, and GPU is going to be for high throughput, for quicker calculations. So if you have an application 
GPUs are going to be uh, likely going to be a good fit if it's going to be doing computation using large arrays, matrices, or images. So again, that's working up the data in parallel and doing those computations on the different GPU cores. So if your data set can fit in the GPU memory, um, then that's going to be good for uh, quick computations. We have a standard uh, GPU memory on Perlmutter is 40 gigabytes, but we do have nodes that are larger GPU memory of 80 gigabytes, I believe. Can you talk about how a GPU works versus a CPU for those that don't know? Um, we can, and actually, so in our supercomputing crash course, we're actually, which is going to be on the 28th at the end of June, um, our user engagement uh, lead, Dr. Rebecca Hartman Baker, will be doing that um, training. And in that, we will talk in detail about how a CPU works versus a GPU, as well as some of the different parallel programming paradigms that you can use on both. So stay tuned. Okay, good. But good, um, good recommendation. We're gonna definitely talk about that. Okay, so we have a few options for using um, using uh, GPUs, Python on GPUs at NURSE. And so remember some of the best practices that we want to keep in mind with that is ensuring that you use, utilize a common environment. You want to make sure you check out our documentation that is available, specifically on working on Python at NERSE, Python on Perlmutter, as well as Jupyter, which we're going to talk about a little bit later as well. And again, if you can't, uh, if you find, if you look at our documentation and you see you can't find something, uh, be sure to submit a help ticket so that we can uh, either point you in the right direction or add some resources onto our documentation to help. And it's pretty simple if you want to search for our doc in our documentation on the web, you can enter the topic that you're looking for, like MPI 4.5, and it'll give you a, a number of different matching documents that would be appropriate for you. All right, so that is going to be our Python on GPUs at NURSE. Any questions about that uh, initial material or the wrap up of that Python material. So now we'll get into uh, discussing how you run jobs on a Perlmutter, mm -hmm. uh, as well as a, a couple of other things, uh, how you execute your code, um, getting started about containers and workflows at Perlmutter and some resources that we do have available to help you execute and run your jobs as well. And so we're going to talk about the basics of job submission. And so if you're new to HPC, you might be wondering, um, what is a job? And it's, it's not one that pays, it's one that actually takes away, it takes away your allocation funding dollars or allocation dollars. And so a job is basically how you submit a, a submission for computation on a Perlmutter. And so anytime you connect to a Perlmutter, when you connect, you're going to be on um, a login node. And so that also includes if you connect using our Jupyter Hub for Jupyter sessions. And so one thing to keep in mind when you connect on the login nodes is that they are not meant for large scale computations and analysis. Um, your log, the login nodes are shared nodes by, and they're shared by the users. Um, so you want to be kind to your fellow users. And we have about 40 login nodes that users can use for simple tasks like debugging and um, compiling their codes and whatnot. Um, so where does my computation go? When you go to submit a, a, a job for computation, it is going to go on our compute node. And so our compute nodes are where all of the scientific action occurs. We have over 4,800 compute nodes, um, 1,792 of those are GPU nodes, and 3,072 are CPU nodes that we have available for computation. Can I ask something? So is there a threshold for the applications that you run on the login node, like in terms of? time limit or resource limit that you can use, like 
for um, login nodes, correct me if I'm wrong, it's four, and you, you can do, you can access four and you have four hours. Four hours. Mm -hmm. Like you can run an application for four hours and it's not considered as like a mm -hmm. computation heavy and long. I mean, if it's computation, maybe it's different, but like you can run a debugging thing for like four hours. You know? that's the one. Do not run your but, any of production but it's on not, the login yeah. node. Get a, a computer node so that you get exclusive access. Yeah, because it's, login nodes are shared too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you so. find some, somebody using you know, uh, extensive and need to use an extensive CPU or uh, uh, memory to mm -hmm. run, by you. But general rule is please do your production workload on the computer node. Good question, though. And a lot of um, things like that, uh, I believe Libby went over it quickly yesterday, but then within our QoS or uh, term quality of service, it of the details, the specifics of the different queues and how the restraints involved. Good question, though. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay. And so, how are jobs managed on? HPC systems, we have what's called a scheduler or a workload manager. For us, we use what's called Slurm, and Slurm is an open source tool that you can use for large-scale high-performance computing uh, job management. So Slurm has a number of different responsibilities in helping us to manage the resources on Perlmuter. Uh, it can allocate the computing resources for jobs that need to execute. Um, it executes and monitors all of those jobs, and it provides for management of the priorities of the jobs as well. So if you're familiar with Slurm, it's going to be configured a little bit differently for Perlmuter and for um, really for any HPC system. So it is an open source uh, tool, but we have uh, modified it to take so that it best will work for Perlmuter. And so how do you get a job from Slurm? So there are different ways in which you can uh, run a job on or submit a job on Slurm. One of those ways is through uh, interactive job, which you can do on a login node. And so this gets an allocation on a node or it can do on a set of nodes. And so keep in mind that at, at Nurse, this will default to running your login shell on a node in that allocation. So anytime, and you can do a simple, um, command to uh, submit, and in this, in the screenshot here, you can see that um, an example of how to do an interactive command, and later we'll go into what all of these different flags mean, but what you can see is the different steps, the output that you get as you submitted your job. Um, after SALOP as go, goes through, it says you'll get a confirmation that the job allocation is pending, and then it'll give you a, a, another confirmation if it's queued and waiting for those resources. Once those resources have been allocated and, and then the job, the job allocation is granted, and then if it's waiting for the resource to configure, and then it will, the node will become ready for it to execute. And this will occur um, in the background, will occur as you submit the job. Okay, and so you saw the long command with a bunch of uh, flags and other constraints. So what exactly did that command ask Slurm to do? So the SLF command has a number of different um, options. And so the dash A option, option is for the account. And so the account is going to be what your project is that you're assigned to. So, you know, it might be an M and then a four digit number um, for training, we do an in-train account that users can use. So that is what that account is referring to. Um, it also um, is going to, we also have the in option and that will let you know the uh, number of nodes that will be utilized. And so with the in option is here, we have it set for just one, we need just one node. T is gonna tell us the amount of time that this that this request, this job is going to take. And we have T set for 10 here. Um, and that is the T constraint is going to be given in minutes. 
And then we have our C, which is going to give us a constraint of whether we want it to be GPU or CPU um, for that. And so that's just specifying the type of node that you want to use. So that is our SLF command, and that is would be how you would submit um, a job on SLRM or on through SLRM on Chromium. And so how do you get a job from SLRM? So we have interactive allocations in Jupyter that you can use and access. And so on this, we can, um, you can, once you log into Jupyter Hub, which I'll discuss later, you'll have access to how you can make advantage of, take advantage of it. You can log in on a login node or shared node as well. In other different nodes, you have exclusive CPU, exclusive GPU, and other configurable jobs as well. Okay, so how do you use an interactive job? So again, interactive jobs are good for you want if you want to test and debug your code and you know quick, very simple benchmarking that is not going to be intensive, and also good for profiling your applications as well. So in order to use an interact, interactive job, you want to set your um, Q, QoS or the Q flag to being interactive. And again, you can the limit on interactive nodes, you can use one to four nodes, and you have a, a max wall time of four hours for that submission. Um, you can also do a shared interactive as well. And in that case, you get half of the node max, and again, four hours of max wall clock time as well. So those are some of the different constraints that you have to keep in mind with if you are going to be um, doing an interactive job. Any questions? In what are the different values for QoS? Like there is interactive, what are the others? Are those categorical things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, interactive, you have uh, debug, you have it's a, a whole table on our nurse website, actually. I think it's in this. But there are different options for you to use for that. And uh, we'll pull out a little bit later. Okay. So let's continue on. But that's a good question because that constrains you to the type of the limitations for your computation and whatnot that you can use. So if you need more time, um, outside of the four hours on an interactive job or larger nodes, then what you want to do is use a, a batch job. And so with a batch job, basically what that means is you go into a queue and our scheduler will prioritize the jobs based off of the resources that you need. So um, if you are going to do a computation that needs about, let's say, 20% of our nodes, um, it's fairly safe to say that you won't have that scheduled very quickly. It's going to have to be prioritized um, in other jobs that maybe are quicker, um, that are going to use less uh, nodes and less time will run before your job. And so that's what SLARM does. It kind of determines what job will have priority in execution. And a simple way for you, and it's very simple to submit a, a SLARM, a batch job, you just use the s bash command in SLARM, and then you will have the job script that you will submit. And in this command, you can see it's you submit a job, and then it'll provide you with a confirmation of the job number, job ID that has been submitted. And so s batch is here. And so what does a, the batch script look like? So anytime you are going to submit a job, you need to have a script that basically outlines the resources that you need to utilize. So, so within our script, you want to see that the options are very similar to the SALA command, but you are just laying those out um, in a script that can be executed later. And so in this, we can say we can ask for four nodes, for eight hours and our job name, we specify what we want this job to be called. It's called science. And that's the additional this option that you can add to customize how you want uh, parameters to show in your SLARM, in your, the SLARM command. 
And so you can organize your SWARM by the different outputs, like if you want to organize it by job name or job ID as well. And so this is just a simple script that would be within a within uh, your .sh file that lays out everything, your accounts, the type of queue you want. So another um, QoS that you can use is just regular, um, the number of nodes, the time, constraint, the CPU, and again, you have the name of the job, the science, and then specifics for how you want the output and error to be. And so at the bottom, you have this srun command that will essentially, basically, this is what happens when your job executes. The srun command is executing your job. And so with Slurm, you can add specific environment variables like Slurm in nodes. And so this will basically allow for you to pull from your environment the number of nodes you've requested. And so SRUN is going to be very similar to if you've done um, uh, MPI on any other system, there is a command MPI run or MPI execute, and SRUN is basically that version for SLARM. So here we have a number of different, very helpful uh, SLARM environment variables and commands that you can use. You have your the SLARM job number of nodes that you're going to use, the SLARM and task per node, uh, the CPUs on node that you need to use, the GPUs on node that you need to use as well. And so some other things that you can consider is if you are looking to get the total CPUs, it's going to be the multiple of the, the, the job number of nodes and the CPUs on node use. Um, task is going to be the job number of nodes and any task per node, et cetera. And then we have the other um, options for those uh, values as well that you can see. So it's different useful um, things that you can, uh, commands and things that you can use in order for you to uh, submit your jobs on front. And so what does the dash Q option do? Again, this is one of the different Q limits that we do have. And so Q is going to be our debug, uh, is going to be our QoS. And so within that, you have uh, one to eight nodes, and you have a 30 minute max wall time. And basically, that can be used if you're benchmarking and testing for some scalability. You have also regular and shared queues that can be used. And this is going to be where a lot of our large scale science computations are going to be done. And again, with this, you can have a 24 hour max wall time and you have 5,000 max job submissions that you can do. And so on the queue, you can have just a queue flag is going to be regular or shared as well. And then you also, so those are some of the different queue options. Any questions? Yeah, I'm answering the question. Okay, all right, awesome. All right, so how do I debug my script? So there are a number of different options that you can view, um, different command line options that you can use for debugging and for scaling your tests. Um, of course, you can do your debug and the, the queue specify your debug, the time that you want to use, and then submitting that scrap, submitting that script. Um, you can also do different things like scale testing, where you can test the scalability of the performance of your, your code as well. And in that, you can pick a, a specific multiple of how you want to test it from, you know, 1 to uh, 128 or 2 to whatever, however you, your application is going to you need to measure out this kind of scale. And we have specific trainings that talk about how to use our performance tools and different um, models that you can use. So be on the lookout for communications about some of those trainings as well. They're in our weekly email, which everyone should be getting every Monday. Okay, now once we've talked about submitting jobs and the different type of jobs that we can submit, so how do I see if my job is working in SLARM? So within Slurm, there is a Slurm Q command, and it's just SQ. And basically, this will provide you with the information about jobs that are in your in the Slurm Q. 
Um, it can return a lot of information um, with what's available on Perlmuter. So there are, uh, you can customize that with different flags to what you want to display. You can also use uh, FQS, and that's the shortcut that you can use. And it's going to specify some of the, the different options that are available for jobs that you have run. And so in this example, you can see some of the uh, some of the jobs that I run, some of them are uh, scripts that run every morning for me and some other jobs that I've submitted as well. And so the time is how long the job has been running or executing. Now, let's say you submitted a job, but you decided, oh, let me, I wanna work on something else and I just wanna cancel that job and not use up my allocation. You can also use the, you can use the slurm cancel command, which is s cancel. And basically what that does, it sends a signal to slurm to stop your job from executing. And this can be, can occur for a number of different things. If you, you think your job is taking a little too long to run or it's taking uh, longer than expected, or you maybe in the wrong parameters and you want to make some changes, then you can, you can hit, the cancel command so that you do not uh, waste some of your allocation hours and your project hours. And that's an important thing to keep in mind because you're working on a project and the allocation is shared amongst your, your project members. So you don't want to um, use up uh, your share of the allocation um, over uh, before, before you are, before it's needed. All right, and so you can also look at some completed jobs that have happened on Storm as well using the Storm accounting command, and that's just S accounts. And all that will do is it will give you accounting data for all jobs and job steps that have or have executed in Storm. Um, by default, it's going to show jobs like within the last day that have executed. So it will basically show you everything that has executed. Um, in that account. So, so a number of different commands to help you understand and uh, see how to submit and manage your jobs and slurms. And so different ways also that you can look at um, specific uh, jobs that have completed for S accounts. So the J flag can be used if you want to retrieve information about one specific job. Um, if you want to pass in other attributes and get pull that information, such as, you know, if you have a specific name of the job and a constraint that it's bound to, and you can search and pull the jobs that are have completed using those constraints. And then you can do things like pull uh, jobs that are their current state is and running or whatnot. So those are different kind of options that you can use for I'm um, using um, for submitting jobs in Slurm. So next up, we will continue on and talk about jobs in containers and uh, how to most efficiently use those on Perlmuter here at Nurse. So running jobs in containers. Uh, is everyone familiar with containers? No? Okay. You want to speak up a little bit more? Is that Docker and Podman, something like that? Yeah. So normally, instead of when we run uh, the jobs directly in uh, HPC, we will start a container which contain all of the like packages, whatever Python, and we just start the container, and they're all set. Mm -hmm. So it basically provides for you a safe little think about it as a virtual environment for you to play in, like a little playground where you're not damaging someone else's system yeah, completely. So that it's a safe way, it's reproducible, you can share your environment, and it has minimal impact on the actual physical system. So they make a great way for you to, um, to constrain your development in the execution environment, and it also makes it easier for you to share and port that environment across different um, across different systems as well. And so with NURSE, we are shifting towards supporting two container te technologies, um, 
Shifter and Potman, and you can use these for building images on your on the login mode. Um, at this time, we don't support Singularity or AppTainer on Folio. And so, one way that you want to consider um, what is a container, and again, a container is just going to be a type of software where you can you can you're able to pack up all of your resources into one. So you can think about it as Docker. Docker is one of the uh, most, uh, I guess, well-known container technologies that initially came out in the past decade. And so with Docker, you have a specific specification that you use. You can do your build. You will do a Docker build. And then you will need to ship it, which is where you do your Docker push. And then once you have done that and it's accessible, then you can run your container. And that's when you do a command, Docker run. And so all of these settings are contained in your Docker file, which is basically how you use, how it's used to create your uh, container image. So once you have a container, you need to uh, register or ship it. So you can register it at nurse at registry.nurse.gov, and then you're able to build it. You can do docker build-t, and then you will have the, that, uh, the registry domain, domain name, as well as your account, as well as other components. And then you have to do your Docker login at registry.nurse.gov and Docker push, as well as registry again for shipping. And then once it is available, you can run that container with Shifter or Podman on Folio. So it's a a, pro, a, a little bit of a process, but once you do it a, a few times, you'll have the hang of it, and it makes it a lot easier for you to eat. Once you build, build it once, you can then uh, apply it or move it across different systems. And so how do you run a shifter container? So you want to pull your image before you start your job. And so again, that's going to be a command shifter IMG pool, and then registry, and then your image and tag for it. And then in your, your sbatch script, in order to submit it, you're going to do sbatch, and you'll add in the image flag, and then you're going to assign um, the value that is needed for the re that registry and image tag. And then to submit, you were just going to do S run command, and then you'll have to just simply put shifter in the host name. So how do I run a shifter container then? So we have a couple of different op extra options that you can use for running a shifter container. You're able to specify the volume where it's at, um, the environment that you will be using. Um, you have Clear environment flags, you can specify the working directory that is going to be appropriate for it. And then you're also able to specify the different modules that you will need to use within it. Okay. And a very similar um, approach when running on Podman. Um, Podman is another uh, way in which you can execute containers on Perlmutter. And so again, with Podman, you'll still have to have your appropriate um, variables as well as your in the S run command, you're gonna put Podman that's HPC and then run and then your appropriate um, image and then the host name as well. So these are two uh, technologies that we're, we've gotten behind to help with um, our container workflows and um, science workflows within the past uh, few years. And so how do I run a Podman HPC container? Again, you will have to pull it, very similar to uh, doing other with a Docker container. So you'll do Podman HPC build, um, the image name and tag, and then you need to migrate it as well. Um, other Docker Podman options include uh, the volume where it's going to be, um, the host, the, the host that it's going to be, and then other modules options that you can include uh, if you're going to use MPI, a GPU, or a CUDA MPI as well. All right, so next up, we are going to 
talk about executing multiple jobs and workloads. Okay. So let's say you get into a situation where you have multiple things that you need to do. I'm sure we've all been there. Um, with Slurm, we can bundle jobs and we can execute those jobs either um, sequentially or simultaneously. And in order for us to do that, we can use what's called a Slurm or job array. And so this basically has a, a, a job task that has different, different inputs for execution. And so we also have workflow tools that we can use. A new parallel is, can be used in order to fit small tasks into one node. And then we have other tools that can, can be used for more complex tasks as well. And so, and we've taken a big step towards figuring out ways to help our users um, do their science in a, a seamless manner and workflows are a, a big part of that. And so within, within Slurm, you can bundle um, your work into one, one job as well. So if you have, let's say you, you wanna do some testing on different sizes, different number of nodes and different um, cores that you're gonna need. So you can bundle those jobs to run sequentially if all of the other SBatch commands are the same. And so the only thing that you would need to do is You'll wait for the scheduler. The scheduler is going to run each SRON command one after the other. Um, so what that means is that the first command will run and execute. And then once it is done, the second uh, job or the second um, submission will run and then so forth. Um, with regards to time, what is one thing that you might want to make sure you keep in mind with um, bundling jobs? Well, one thing you want to keep in mind is that typically when you submit one job, of course, the time is going to be smaller. So it's pretty common that people, you know, if you think a job takes three hours and you only put um, three hours in it, but then you add three or four more jobs, you want to make sure you adjust the time accordingly so it doesn't, the job doesn't fail before all of the S runs have completed. So just make sure you keep in mind some of those constraints that are likely to vary um, for some of those different runs. And so you can also have them run simultaneously. And that is just simply adding the and character at the end of each S run line. And then you want to also end after the last S run, put a wait. And that basically will say that all of those jobs will, the scheduler needs to wait until all of the jobs are ready to execute. Now with this in mind, you have to keep in consideration that this is for, this is going to run the same job with the same input. <clears throat> or, or different, same size with different inputs. My misspoke there. Does this make sense? Okay. And another way that you can also do it is using a, a job array. So with the job array, is basically you're providing um, Slurm with the ability to manage those jobs independently. So if one task fails, it doesn't affect the other ones, um, which, you know, is very good if you, you know, your the jobs are not dependent on one another and you still need that data. So this is a good option for if you're doing things that require large statistical input over the same inputs. And then if you need to do different parameter sweeps over different input files. And so with this, you'll just need to make sure that you have um, additional uh, Farm batch command flag set. Um, you will need to have your um, the farm array set that value for one to four, and then you're going to echo that the value that is there for the array for the job ID. And if you want to know more about um, using job arrays, again, it's you can also uh, consult with the uh, nurse documentation. And so another way that you are able to, 
to manage tasks um, is using the new parallel. And so this can be great for small tasks that need to execute. So it has a faster start time than S runs. And so you can you reuse the allocation for all of your tasks with that. Um, and as each task finishes, the next one will start. So it provides for an efficient way for you to use your allocation. And so in order for you to use GNU Parallel, you will want to use a module load parallel um, in your SPAT script. And then you will have, instead of SRON, you will do Parallel. And then you will have the, the flags that you will need to have set um, the weapons to execute, and then those inputs. And so we also have options for more complex workflows and dependencies that we can use. And so with these more complex workflows, we have different um, software frameworks and infrastructures that are we able to use to manage those. Um, things like uh, Globus Compute can be used and Fireworks. And within this, we can write code to define a specific workflow, workflow to automate any um, background processes and things that need to occur. Um, so this is often written using Python. Um, you can have dependencies for different tasks. Uh, within the DOE, we have a number of different resources that are available to learn more about workflows and workflow trainings as well. Um, and so if you click on this link, you will be able to access some of those uh, past trainings that have occurred and the materials that are available for you to learn more about that. And we have different trainings on workflows throughout uh, the year as well. And so if you have any specific questions about some of these resources and making use of workflows, you can also be sure to submit a help ticket for us to assist you. Okay. So some best practices that we can have, that we can keep in mind and running jobs and working with uh, workflows. So you want to keep in mind that scheduling plays a very important part. Um, each job has a priority value. And so that is going to be grouped by the user, the QoS, and then your account. So only two jobs uh, per these groupings will be at priority at a time. So more jobs can run, but only two will age. Uh, so our main scheduler and Swarm uses a priority list. It schedules a few days in the future based off of what is in the queue. We also have a, a backfield scheduler that we can use that is able to prioritize, prioritize our scheduling utilization for shorter jobs that maybe have gotten added after some of those longer ones. So really it's a balancing that and seeing what is going to be most efficient. If something is you know, going to take quick and easy to run, it's going to have priority over something that might take um, you know, 18 hours that has been in the queue um, longer than the short job that just got submitted. So those are some top things to consider when you're doing your job submissions. Um, if you are gonna need results quicker, it's probably wiser for you to submit your job sooner rather than waiting to the last minute. So scheduling tips, um, one job with a large allocation um, per no priority aging would be at its highest and that can get scheduled first. Um, considerations for shorter time with jobs, they are easier to schedule um, as a backfill. Um, you can make use of a, a workflow manager. Um, you wanna make sure that you choose the right time for Slurm, uh, balance between enough runtime and waiting in the queue for a long time. Uh, typically, we'll, you'll get some communication from us if um, ProMuter is being underutilized and we'll kind of let you know like, hey, now might be a good time if you have some computations or simulations that you need to run because the queue is uh, pretty open. So remembering all of the different uh, Slurm commands that you can use can be um, a little tricky without uh, enough practice. On Chrome, on uh, our website, we do have a job script generator that you can utilize. All you need to do is enter the type of machine you're gonna use, 
the name of the application and if you have a job name and other components. And what it will do is it will automatically create the S batch script that you could use to submit your job. So if you're a little confused about um, you know, setting some of the values, you can use this simple job script generator and it will create the script for you to submit the job. Okay, so we have a couple of different options you want to make sure you keep in mind if you are submitting that OpenMP code. Um, specifically, you want to make sure that you submit your submit your environment variables. So that's going to be the OpenMP numbreds uh, variable, OpenMP places, and if you want to do any specific uh, type of processor binding as well. Um, some libraries are already there by default, like Blasco Hawk. Pack and uh, NumPy and Python. Uh, small NumPy arrays can be faster with threads for setting these specific type of um, settings. So you want to keep in mind uh, the number of threads that your application or code is going to need and if there are going to be any um, contention for resources. And again, for open for MPI codes, you want to set the number of processes that you need to use, um, or the number of nodes that you need to use. You can use uh, you can use CPU bind to set specific cores with uh, less than the, to, to set the number of cores and also the number of threads as well. Then we have other options for MPI OpenMP hybrid codes. You need to specify the number of threads as well as the number of cores per task as well. And the number of cores per task should be uh, greater than or equal to the number of OpenMP threads that you um, that you assign for your for your uh, job. Then other specific options again for GPU and GPU flag, make sure you use a GPU constraint and then you want to be sure that you set the number of GPUs for tasks that are going to be needed as well. Okay, so in this we have covered a lot in um, what is a job, how to run a job, um, working it with containers and running a job in containers, workflows, docs, as well as um, as well as script generators as well. And all again, all of this is available on our documentation, which you can easily access at docs.nurse.gov. Okay. All right. Any uh, questions?